In the context of the pandemic, a large part of activities is expressed digitally. We propose to create once more in these troubled and troubling times, along with other actants of the planet. The organization of the symposium is a pooling of interests between the organizers, publics, and participants. The digital platform proposes to go beyond dissemination by adopting participatory methods. As many other have expressed, it is difficult for us to endorse the idea that social distancing is the key to curbing the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. It is therefore necessary and urgent to invent new ways of practicing social solidarity. The digital platform produced jointly by Hexagram Scientific Committee, the production team, participants and publics is a full-fledged research creation project. Our posture is eminently practical reflexive to reflect collectively on the sharing of autonomy in action to practice the sharing of autonomy and agency, social solidarity, and research in action. Today, we have the pleasure to discuss with interdisciplinary artist Francois Quivillon, whose work examines the interactions among environmental changes, social issues, and technological innovations. In his practice, he explores the phenomena of the world and of perception by implementing processes sensitive to environmental fluctuations and human interference. For this special occasion, design and computation art students from Concordia University enrolled in the seminar Critical Materiality are also with us. Critical Materiality is an advanced special topic research studio course that opens up new perspectives, joint methodologies, and lines of inquiries between design and computation arts disciplines. With a special emphasis on making and process, students leverage material technological exploration and develop artistic and public responses to social environmental topics. How do we encourage intelligent and sustainable engagement with matter? How would response to public problems be different were we to consider the vibrancy, the agency, and the responsiveness of materiality? how to develop innovative expressions of the couple matter form and design sensible, sensitive and responsive works. How do materials influence the experiments and the experiences we enable as design and artistic practitioners? Before we start, let me introduce our guest. François Quivillon holds a master's degree in visual and media arts from UCAM in 2008. He was involved with several artist-run centers and research groups, <laughs> and his work, much of it developed during artist residencies, has been presented internationally over the last two decades. In 2019, he had three solo exhibitions, uh, Manoeuvrer l'incontournable at Expression in Saint-Hyacinthe, Conduite algorithmique um, at Musée d'art uh, de rouen noranda and Gravity at Centro de Cultura Digital in Mexico City. François' presentation will begin with an overview of works that address planetary dis disruptions, as well as those affecting contemporary media, such as the relations between algorithms and photographic images, photogrammetry, computer vision, and other forms of computational photography. After, uh, he will talk about recent projects rooted in geology and the materiality of digital technologies. We really encourage you to ask questions uh, in the chat uh, and I will relay those questions. Uh, after Francois' presentation, uh, the critical materiality participants are also encouraged to uh, jump in the conversation and ask their questions live. To you, Francois. Hi, hi everyone. Are you hearing me well? Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Alice, and for the invitation. So um, I'll begin my presentation with works I did almost 20 years ago. So at the beginning of uh, the 2000s, I worked, I worked a lot with uh, the changes of states of matter, in particular with water. So here you see defrost. Uh, it's a video installation that explores the different states of water by orchestrating its transformation. At the center of three screens is a slowly glowing mass of ice around which several phenomena caused by thermal contrast evolve in a matter that can suggest a geological time scale. I'm gonna start the video. So ice, water, and steam allow us to work. Uh, I'm gonna put the volume a little lower 
allows to work with a variety of audiovisual textures, but they are also very uh, rich symbolically and uh, metaphorically. So the work uh, evo evokes the nature cycle as well as disturbances associated with climate change. Um, after defrost, I made Eta Interval. Uh, it was my first interactive installation that used a computer vision system. So uh, the closest we would get this to the screen, the faster the block of ice would melt. It was, of course, uh, not very subtle uh, reference to human contribution to global warming, but also a comment on uh, surveillance. So magnitude is similar. So the icy texture at the top of a cubic structure is made of uh, irregular lines that retrace the position and movements of uh, the exhibition's uh, visitors. So if there were two person, one in front of the other, it would connect them with a line. And over time, uh, it, it did a very uh, complex structure. So the surface was uh, covered, uh, what also, was also covered with white grains and powder that was reconfigured by the vibration of five subwoofers that were also reacting to the activity of the visitor in that uh, room. So strange attractors. Uh, this architectural intervention uh, separates spaces and connects them back together through a smoke screen that is contained in a glass wall. The density and the dynamics of uh, artificial uh, fog was altered by con computer controlled ventilators. Uh, they were activated according to the movement and position of the public on both sides. So Strange Attractors is inspired by chaos theory, particle physics, and ma mathematical si simulations, but it's mainly uh, thoughts about the notions of screen and interface. So a screen can display something, but it can also hide something. Between 2006 and 2008, when I was working on this, social media such as Facebook were beginning to become popular and we were shifting from a form of online anonymity to revealing our identities and personal lives on the web. So different processes of disclosure and dissimulation were activated. Um, the screen became filters that regulate communications between a multiple of spaces and people. So I was also interested uh, by uh, space-time representation that are directly linked to the structure of different media. Here is a work from 2004 that's entitled Montreal, October 28, 2004. It's a QuickTime VR. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's like the ancestors of uh, today's panoramic 360 degree images. So uh, with that project, I amplified its constructed, its constructed nature by following the sun during a full day and capturing audio sample every time I took a picture every six or eight minutes. So in this audiovisual panorama, the 360 degree loop of the QuickTime VR displays a 24 hour cycle. So that's uh, one image from a series that's entitled Chronoscopy. So in that series, the small, smallest visible pieces of information in a digital image, the pixels, captured fragments of successive movements over a period of, uh, of time ranging from one to several hours. So the images were constructed sequentially from top to bottom and left to right, like we write or read the text. So, um, and for instance, uh, here you said traffic jam. Here at the intersection of McGill College and uh, St. Catherine, you can see uh, details such as the light. The red light is uh, lasting twice the time of the, as the um, red, green light, for instance. And here you can see the tramway schedule in Orléans uh, and people waiting for it, but different people at the top and at the bottom of the, the bench. So I used a similar process uh, for a variable sky, CL variable. Here you see one year sampling of Montreal sky. 
uh, using RAMCAM archive as raw material, variable skies displays a yearly sampling of the skies of seven places um, located at different latitudes on Earth. So you have the North Pole to the left and the, right, the South Pole to the right, and the middle is the equator. So a sound synthesis process also converts the images, colors, and brightness to sound. So you can see and hear difference of the day to night ratio. Um, urban light pollution, Montreal and Sydney. And uh, you see this, the pulse of the, the moon here in uh, Monaki. It's an astronomical observatory. Um, in 2010, I started working with uh, Anderid. The, the work is made of 3D point clouds of different locations that were created using photogrammetry and geomatic data. Millions of points distributed into space. They are just XYZ coordinates. So I connected the, these point clouds um, to uh, environmental data that was collected on the internet. And I put that 3D model in a constant flux. So uh, the wind direction, temperature, atmospheric pressure controls different parameters that constantly shift the image's uh, appearance. So Deriv is in a state of a perpetual change, reflecting weather conditions, daylight variations, moon phases. It combines predictable and unpredictable phenomena. So that's a simulation of the model that's being transformed. Afterwards, I'll show uh, images of the installation. So the position and movements of the public influences the point of view on that space. Ultimately, the space was barely recognizable, but you can feel the unfolding phenomena. Here it's a cold, windy night in the Sherbrooke city, for instance. <clears throat> mm, that's New York City. So with that work, I started uh, doing a lot of artist residencies. And since then, it's, I would say, the main context in which I work. So that's Lyon at night. So the, the space completely disappears. But you see that there is a storm unfolding. So in 2014, I did a residency in Iceland, which led to several works. One of them is entitled Variations pour corps des vents, Variations for Strings and wing, Winds. <laughs> Sorry. So at the time, uh, several interesting phenomena related to image making caught my attention. Uh, first, the drone were becoming affordable and became popular tools. The selfie sticks made the, their appearance. And the combination of the two also, the dronies taking selfies with drones. Uh, was a phenomenon that started appearing. So uh, variations for strings and wings, uh, winds, sorry, is a tongue-in-cheek uh, reference to these phenomena. It's a low-tech drone that is simultaneously playful and threatening. And the cord is like a long selfie stick. The camera is oriented toward the person that flies it. So it first took the form of uh, social media interventions on Vine, Instagram, and Facebook. And afterward, I did um, an interactive installation that was shown at RTV Studio next to the Montreal Symphony House at Place des Arts. So like a kite, the control of that instrument was limited and the instability was growing as we were playing with it.
it was also shown as a video installation at Expression last year on six different screens and there were six uh, different headsets also that you had to find which headset went with uh, which screen. So waiting for Bardar Bunga was also made during my residency in Iceland. Let's turn the volume down a bit. So in response to alerts about the Bardar Bunga's upcoming eruption, so, so it's a procedural video installation that examines the monitoring and transformation of volcanic areas. It consists of a database of hundreds of video loops that are captured around the um, Vatnajökull glacier under which the stratovolcano is located. So they are presented according to a probabilistic system influenced by data coming from the sensors of the computer that runs the installation. So there's a monitor that shows graph that could be geological, volcanic data in real time, but it's fact, it's the data coming from the computer. So it's energy consumption, the speed of its fan, internal sensors that um, capture the um, temperature, for instance. So the video has an unpredictable unfolding and its conclusion remains unknown as the systems monitoring and the course of events that it presents influence each other. So the scenes that I captured related to geothermal phenomena and things that were happening on the landscape are edited in a way that it's like a data visualization of the computer's activity. So the device that's presenting the video uh, as activities like translated in, uh, in the video's narration in one way. So, uh, so what would I found interesting about that work is that we apprehend and monitor a wide range of potentially catastrophic events that are or seem to be out of our control, such as ecological energy economic crisis. And right now the pandemic data graphs are influencing our everyday lives. So it was first um, shown as a, the monitor was on a wall the first time I showed it. And afterward, I put it in a transport case, such as the one that was used uh, on top of the volcano, uh, on top of the glacier under which is the volcano. So in 2015, I did an arts and science residency in collaboration with Sparabol and Université de Sherbrooke. So, uh, so I collaborated with the two members of the NICOTIS research group. NICOTIS stands for Neurocomputational and Intelligent Signal Processing. I collaborated with uh, Louis Comer, who was interested by the sonification of uh, neural networks, and Sean Wood, who was working on the cocktail party problem. The cocktail party problem is when you try to follow a conversation in a very noisy room. So how do you isolate uh, an audio signal that's full of noise? So uh, we developed a granular sampling system that anal analyzes and maps audio features, you can see it here, such as the amplitude, balance, pitch, spectrum, frequencies, harmonics, and percussiveness of sounds. So in, in one axis, for instance, in the X axis could be the amplitude of the sound, in the Y axis, the frequencies. Right in the middle, you would have mid frequencies with a, a volume that is in the middle, so high volume, mid frequencies, and so on. So we had at least 12 parameters that could be mapped in a space like this, but it was a 3D space, plus audio and uh, more information, such so, uh, as the color of points, the size of points. So I did different experiments from what we developed. Um, so there's a random walker algorithms that generates an endless composition based on the relationships between these sound samples. Here it's an eternal storm in a point cloud. And this is uh, samples of uh, birds uh, tweeting and chirping that are mapped according to different features. And I'm changing the configuration. So it's changing the composition
So here's a map of the noise around Sporobol that was captured. Very, very short audio samples that are mapped in a chaotic way. So after this work, I began working on algorithmic drive, a body of work, and I had the occasion to work with another member of Nicotis, uh, Etienne Richard. So algorithmic drive is a body of work based on observing the, the development of driverless car and dash cam compilation. So autonomous vehicles are, uh, it's a good to topic to explore the operational nature of contemporary images as Aaron Faraki or Trevor Paglin would say, images made by machines for other machines rather than the, to be seen by humans. And on their sides, um, dashcam videos are popular type of video content on YouTube and social media. Dashcam has been around since the end of the 20th centuries on police cars. And it became popular around 2009 when a lot of people starting, started using them in Russia. So having Cameras on cars led to the recording of a lot of catastrophic events and weird scenes. So these work play with the tension generated by putting uh, uh, the program behavior of mobile robotics in relation with the uh, unpredictable, unpr unpredictable nature of the world. So one of these systems that I use is Segnet. <laughs> so the... <laughs> <laughs> the neural network uh, does a semantic segmentation of the scene and classifies the content in several categories. It also generates an uncertainty model that you can see here that is uh, uh, that maps uh, the zone that it has difficulties identifying. So I think that the topic of autonomous vehicles is a good one to explore the different challenges of AI. So you may know that experiment, uh, that project, let's say. It's uh, MIT's Moral Machine. Uh, it's a platform that examines ethical and moral issues. The survey was answered by millions of persons around the world uh, that were placed in front of difficult situation where we need to choose between the lesser of two evils. So the result uh, collected through a moral machine showed differences between countries and cultures. So the answers would be completely different if you were in Mexico or in China. So not only there's not a good answer in, two, in that type of context, but it also, it, the answers are different uh, depending on the, the culture. There's also several articles that you see about the social and cultural impacts of AI. Uh, there has been accidents that raised a lot of legal questions. Who's responsible if uh, there's a, a fatal accident that happens. And also, it also raised questions about data that these uh, vehicle collect. So here a scientist uh, had access to a, a damaged uh, Tesla and he could uh, find that uh, about the crash, for instance, the last moments of the, the car. So even normal cars are more and more connected and equipped with a variety of sensors and car data is, rapidly, is a rapidly growing industry. And another interesting experiment related to uh, operational images is uh, the analysis of Google Street View images that uh, can estimate the political orientation, income, race, and other specificities of neighborhoods. That was done four years ago uh, when there was elections in uh, the USA, almost like right now, four years later. And reCAPTCHA, that you uh, may know, you, you prove that you are not a robot while you contribute to train robots. And it is often said that AI will eliminate boring and repetitive jobs, but it also relies in part on cheap labor industry of boring and repetitive jobs. There's also environmental arguments for automation, but AI uh, 
has an important environmental impact. It consumes a lot of energy and resources. So these are a lot of ideas that were in my head when I started to develop uh, this body of works. Now we get into the concrete thing. So that's a garment video, that's video that I captured plus data that was coming from the, um, the onboard computer of my car. It's a very basic, normal car. So I recorded for um, two or three years, different uh, displacements that I made uh, by having uh, audio, video and car data all synchronized together. So I'll just pause here. So during my residency uh, with the Nicotis Research Creation Group, uh, research group, sorry, uh, we um, we analyzed audio, but now uh, I was interested by extracting information from the visual, from images, such as the segnet data that I showed you, but also basic images, the tint, the saturation, the luminosity, also the uncertainty model and different data that was coming from the sensors of the, the vehicle. So stability, speed, uh, the RPM of the engine. So uh, in algorithmic drive, these video and data feed a sampling system that uses signal processing, data analysis and computer vision algorithms to sort the content statistically. For instance, I could uh, select a maximum vegetation and maximum instability, and I would be in the forest on a bumpy road. If I put the lowest uh, temperature, it would be winter time, of course. And also I could extract the scenes where the vehicle was going the fastest if I put the speed to the maximum. So uh, there's a custom made controller that displays data related to each scene and allows to interact with the system's autopilot. So yeah, the database that I uh, constructed was almost almost done uh, when I went to residencies or exhibitions. So I went to um, Newfoundland, for instance, and I had an exhibition in Saskatoon. So I drove to Saskatoon and came back to the US. So I collected um, videos and data from different regions for um, two or three years. So this is, this is a driverless car afterlife, another work that I made in parallel. Uh, I captured uh, this image in Newfoundland. So I was curious to, to see that what the, the image, how the image would be analyzed if I turned it upside down. So since the segment is mostly trained on images where buildings and uh, the sky is always on top of the road, it tries to identify right here to the right uh, skies and buildings in the road that's on the top of the image and in the sky that's at the bottom of the image try to differentiate what is the the, the road and the sidewalk so in blue in blue it would be the sidewalk so voila what interested what is uh, interesting me in that image is the frontier between the different categories in particular in the sky uh, where what's the difference between the sky and the buildings where um, 
in the situation where there's none of these, you know, he, he's, it's the road, but he, he's trying to identify buildings and the sky in that zone. So uh, voila, that's a very simple image, but it kind of condenses a lot of ideas I had at the, at the time. I also made a series of uh, videos that explores this topic and its challenge. Here, the camera and microphone are com completely obstructed by snow in less than one minute. In this video, you see a deep neural network training to decode its surroundings and trying to identify the road that is covered with snow. So what's the sidewalk, what's the road, and the rest of uh, the environment around. Also bug track tracker, which is a bit of a ironic work. Lost in the forest, where I, it's more of a rhythmical composition. The crossing, so registration points and displacement vectors try to calculate the future position of objects. And here it's the same optical flow technique, technique that gives the impression that the car is contemplating waves breaking on the, on the shore. This was uh, the exhibition at Expression last year, where I presented uh, a lot of the works from that body of works. Uh, on the headrest, there was two monitors. It's a wall a work called um, Mapping Machine Uncertainty. Uh, I talked earlier about the um, uncertainty model of uh, the neural network. So the zones in uh, black are the zones that it has difficulty identified. So I mapped this to the city around the, around the exhibition space. And so I made a, a map of the machine's uncertainty. So it's at the, at the same time as it's a poetic work, but it's also could have a sort of scientific validity. Where is the, would be, would a, a driverless car be the most confused in that city, for instance? Another work, it's um, a, rear view a rear view mirror with a monitor, a backup camera and ultrasonic parking sensors that are recontextualized in the exhibition space. So every time I showed that work, it was configured differently. Most of the time it was showing the point of view of the projector and uh, there were um, uh, ultralinks, ultrasonic sensors that were calculating the distance between the viewer and uh, the um, rear view mirror. Uh, so uh, in 2017, I did the residency at Gromand National Park, as you see here. I uh, was attracted by a geological formation called the Tablelands. It's one of the few places on Earth uh, where you can have access to rock from the Earth's mantle. So uh, I'll just go back a bit. Uh, so as you can see, these orange rocks contain high amounts of heavy metals and lack the nutrients required to sustain life. So there's very few um, animals or vegetation in that area. So they recall a Martian landscape. Since I was working on algorithmic drive and robotic perception of the world, of course, it made me think about uh, robots on Mars. So I began to work on Meteor. It's uh, made of scans of rocks that are atomized and turned upside down and inside out. one of them. So Meteor uh, recalls the implications and the effects on perception of some technologies such as robotics, remote sensing, augmented and virtual reality, while it offers new perspectives on Earth's substance in its evolution and the process that act upon it. So each of these scenes were loops and they were kind of looped on themselves and it was infinite videos. They had their own atmosphere and the laws of physics were reinvented.
Donc, that work was shown at uh, les rencontres internationales de la photographie, photographie en Gaspésie in 2018 at uh, Miguasha National Park. So I began meteor working with rocks from the Earth's mantle in the tablelands. And that led me to explore the digital materiality and geology of media. So combining the extraction of minerals with extraction of data from mobile devices. So here you see data from the sensors of a phone, for instance. That work is called Tablelands in, Suspe in Suspension. It shows rocks from the Earth's mantle that disintegrate in several ways. The tablet is suspended in the air and the motor keeps it in motion by giving it a little swing that affects uh, the image and sound. So I choose an iPad to create what could be called a reflexive discomfort, so a malaise reflexive, to make people think about the materiality and the environmental impact of these devices. So uh, in 2019, I had a residency at Sandbang in Chukutsimi. Um, it's in Fagli Lac Saint Jean. There's the Lac Saint Jean, of course, but there's a little lake that caught my attention. In fact, when you're in satellite view, satellite photo view, it's one of the first thing that you notice when you look at the region on the map. So the orange bauxite lake stands out but it, it's impossible to see it from the ground. So it's a bit of a paradox since there's artificial hills around it and its access is, its access is controlled. So bauxite is the world's ma um, main source of aluminum and Saguenay Lac Saint Jean is a major pole of aluminum production because of hydroelectricity. So, uh, Another thing that's funny, you can't, it's a, the lake is the first thing that you see on Google Maps, uh, one of the first things that you see, but you can't see it physically. And the same way, everyone in the region knows what bauxite is, but few people have actually seen it. So I had access to a rock of bauxite that uh, you just see here. I scanned it in 3D and I made a work uh, from it. And, so uh, bauxite comes from several regions in the world, such as um, Australia, Africa, South America. It's transformed into aluminum in something like Saint Jean, for instance. Then this aluminum is shipped and enters in the production of different products, while millions of tons of resi residues stay in the region. So the installation that I made is entitled Orbiting Bauxite. It's a phone on a rotary device that shows a bauxite rock used to make aluminum, which is the main mineral constituting the phone. About one quarter of its mass is made from aluminum. It's followed by iron, depending on the model, it's around 14%, I think. So I wanted to evoke this, but also uh, the bauxite residues. So the audiovisual object changes according to the phone's rotation speed. So it's clearly perceptible when it's spinning moderately, but it, is, it becomes distorted at high speeds and recalls the, the red mud of residual matter when it's still. I'm see. I'm just reading the. the I'll take a little break to read the comments and the chat. It's the first time I had the opportunity to read that. It's a lot of uh, technical questions, as you can see. How's the sound of the moving moving pictures of rocks is recorded? What tools? Uh, I use different tools. Um, what you've just seen was made in Unity. Uh, it's a game engine. Maybe you know about it. It's quite. Uh, 
accessible, I think. There's a lot of uh, information on the internet on how to use it. Derive was made in open frameworks like 10 years ago. Uh, and voila. the sound, in fact, it wasn't recorded. It's mostly, uh, mostly a sonification of sound. Uh, I used WISE from Audio Kinetic, which is a company from Montreal, in combination with Unity to uh, do the sound of most of the pieces, but it's always different from one to the other. So uh, voila, maybe that answers a couple of questions. <laughs> so I'll get back to my presentation. I was also interested by lithium, uh, so which has other environmental, societal, and political impacts. So the images we have in mind when we think about lithium are from South America. One of the main problems is water use and contamination. So there's very few water source in that region. It's a desertic environment. So the farmers are left without water. And of course it can have political ramifications. I won't speculate too much, but what happened in Bolivia could be in one way related to the lithium industry. So there's also lithium mining in Quebec. Uh, and so I was interested uh, by uh, that in particular. So uh, there's a project in Abitimi Tibiscamang that raises concern over its possible impact on the escar de saint mathieu berry which is the source of one of Quebec's purest water. So even if it's called a green mineral by the industry and the electrification of transport, sustainable development and renewable, renewable energy is used to promote, promote it, lithium has, has a significant environmental environmental impact. So that mining project has been submitted to the BAP for eval evaluation. So you see that's the mining prospection site. So I went uh, in October 2019, I went with curator Rick Matson uh, in the region and we did some uh, prospecting of that lithium mining prospecting site near La Motte. Um, so you see there is a company, Esca, bottled water company that is really close to uh, that future lithium mine. And there's another mine right here at La Corne that seems to have a lot of financial uh, difficulties in the last year. So uh, voila, so with Eric, we went in that re region and we uh, went to see the La Corne mine and we met the local community that is worried about environmental deterioration. So you see the site, there's some deforestation going on. And yeah, I took pictures of different signs of uh, the mining prospection activities. So here's a specimen of spudsman that contains lithium. So at first I was thinking about doing a work that could be driven by the battery level of the device. Uh, that, uh, but I'm completely reconsidering the form that it will take. It probably won't even involve electronic devices. So this is photogrammetry that I did of uh, the area. So here's another uh, residency I made uh, for connecting the dots in Mexico City. Um, and I collaborated with UNAM's Instituto de Geografia, SOMA and other partners. So at the beginning of my residency, I was interested by the mining activities in extinct volcanoes located uh, in Sierra de Santa Catarina, it's on the periphery of the city. It has uh, impacts on local communities and has several 
environmental impacts also, erosion, deforestation, land size, uh, air quality also. This is the Haltepec volcano, and there's another one right there. So this is one of the first work that I did during that presidency. So it's simultaneously evokes erosion, landslides, extractions, and a volcanic eruption. So it shows volcanic rocks that are rising from the ground that create trails of pixels. The layering of Tizontli is generated by a software that modifies the size, speed, trajectory, and selection of rocks from a database of photogrammetric scans. During the exhibition, I also showed orbiting bauxites and the meteor. So I also did the other works, but it was mainly a prototypes and sketches of things to come. So I wanted to recall that the city is built on an ancient lake surrounded by volcanoes and that the city is sinking. So here you see a topography of Mexico City and its surroundings, approximately 50 by 50 kilometers. And this piece is a twisted loop of LiDAR data around the uh, Centro de Cultura Digital, where the exhibition was held. So it was inspired by the city's unstable grounds, unstable ground, and also roads that were growing on the sidewalk and pavement that I noticed in the neighborhood. So all the sidewalk were kind of tilted and the pavement was kind of uneven. Mm -hmm. Here you see pictures of it, which led to another work also entitled Rooting Infrastructure. So the prolifer prolifer proliferation of roots on fractured sidewalks and heaving pavements uh, and to uh, this work where the, the natural and urban elements are intertwined and are turned inside out and upside down. Uh, 